it's actually an issue of surrender. It's actually learning how to lower those defenses, lower the walls, lower the illusion of control and bend down and with humility and curiosity, start to discover from the vantage point of the child that you were when you went through those events, how did that act, impact you? How did that cause your soul to structure itself in core beliefs and responses to try to feel safe in the world? Welcome to Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. And I've been brainstorming. I've gotten a lot of feedback from our listeners and viewers like you. And I want you to know that I take it seriously and I really do want to hear from you. That if there are specific topics that you want us to cover, I will do my darndest, whether myself or a guest or both, we will cover those topics. And as I've been brainstorming, I feel like there's gonna be a series of just covering lots of different angles of anxiety and depression and relationship dynamics. Those are obviously three things that we work on a lot in therapy and that bring people into my office. And so my passion is to take some of those common um, insights and tools and keys that I may say all day long to various people throughout the day and then try to share them the best that I can. And obviously it's hard because in psychology, there's not like a quantum physics or a thermodynamics law. It's more, everybody is so nuanced and your experience is so unique to you. But if there's something universal that might help you or a friend of yours, and you'd like to share this with them, then we would love to be an asset for your life and for your emotional and mental health. So starting with depression, uh, depression and anxiety are actually basically a very similar disorder. It's just flip of the same coin. It's where we are in the spectrum of control. So control is that unconscious desire to feel like I have the illusion of control that I can control my circumstances, my mood, my experience. And it starts really young. One of our earliest defense mechanisms is called the moral defense. I don't know why it's called that. It's just a name. It means that the child has a belief that if somebody is bad in a scenario and something bad happened, it would be safer to believe that somebody else is good that's protecting and providing for me and bringing my next meal and that I'm the bad one. And that's where shame comes in. So in the psychosexual stages or in the psychosocial stages, whether Freudian or Erickson, you'll see this really early entry of shame. And shame is actually a protection mechanism, interestingly enough. So your defense mechanism of shame is trying to protect you from realizing you're not in control of your own life. It is safer psychologically to think, well, I must be the bad one. If I had just not said that, if I had not thrown my cereal, if I had just obeyed, um, if I had just been a better child, then my parents wouldn't have divorced. Uh, That person wouldn't have touched me. I must have asked for it. The abuse, the yelling, it must somehow be my fault. That is a condition of the soul to try to defend against our own vulnerability in a broken world. And so starting from a very young age, we will get mad at our caregivers, siblings, other people that we would like their approval, teachers, principals, whomever. And we will put that shame back on ourselves as a form of control. So if you think of everything in terms of I am in control, I'm out of control, and that spectrum. So the rest of our lives, we're now asking the question, am I in control of my world? Now, there's two different uh, things to tease out in control. There's the fruit of the spirit, which is I am, I'm the steward of my life. So I do have control and responsibility of brushing my teeth or not, getting out of bed or not, going to grad school or not, being nice to strangers or not. I have that stewardship. And so we're going to use the word stewardship, and then we're going to use control at the macro level. I like the big picture. Am I in control of my world, my relationships, the dynamics, what happens and what doesn't? And so a big part of anxiety and depression, if you think of it on a spectrum of control, is where we are in that trajectory of trying to navigate where am I in macro control? So when I say that, what I'm saying is at an unconscious level, if I believe 
what I do matters. I can control me. Okay. Daddy just yelled at me or mommy just left the room or that boy just uh, said that mean thing or that racist comment was just said or whatever may have just happened. And it just hurt my heart or that sexual event just happened. Human nature is to take control of that, somehow make it my responsibility that I am bad, that I somehow deserved that. And so anxiety then pops up and says, well, if I never let that happen again, if I never show my vulnerability, if I never put myself in being around those kinds of people or events, what you're doing is now picking up an anxiety orientation as a protection or defense mechanism against feeling your own pain. So anxiety is actually at an unconscious level, something you have learned to adapt in your life to try to protect you. That's the irony of when people try to work on anxiety and depression, they often get stuck. We'll start plateauing. We've made so much progress, but often people will go through a plateau period where they no longer make progress. Many times that's because they haven't reconciled these early core defense mechanisms of trying to maintain control at our unconscious level. So with anxiety, we are still operating under the illusion of control that if I am just smart enough, if I work hard enough, if I'm perfect enough, if I'm pretty enough or hot enough or um, academic enough or sports enough or whatever, if I am just this, then nobody will reject me. Nobody will abandon me. Bad things won't happen. And a big part of anxiety is what's called catastrophizing, where your brain will ruminate all the worst case scenarios to try to get you ahead of them so that you can defend or protect yourself from the bad thing happening. The hard thing is when you catastrophize and you think of all the worst case scenarios, it's actually reassuring you. Because it's like in my finite mind, I have tabulated everything that possibly could happen bad. And I psych myself out to think I can have a plan for every one of those. I am reinforcing that behavior because it's giving me a sense of control. It's giving me that illusion of control. That's why many times people whack-a-mole their anxiety and depression symptoms because there's still something I'm getting out of that behavior, even if it's at an unconscious level. I have people every day come in my office and go, oh my gosh, make it stop. My brain won't turn off the thoughts, especially when they're at work trying to focus or trying to make love to their partner or they're in bed and trying to sleep or they're in you know, church or quiet time. And it's like the thoughts just keep coming or this uneasiness, this unsettledness. The irony is your unconscious mind is perpetuating that and keeping that going. Nobody is doing that to you because there's a unconscious process that it's going to protect you. Because at that really young age, we have a belief that if I am just in control of me and my circumstances, nothing bad can happen. So the core belief is that I cannot trust others. And that's one at psychosocial stage, that's one of our earliest questions. Can I trust others to meet my needs or do I need to be in control? And that first question now sets people up for anxiety or depression. And we'll talk about depression more in our future episode, but I figured we would start with anxiety because so many of us around the globe have anxiety and some of it is not even diagnosed and not even recognized or labeled because it's so familiar. It's just such an everyday part of our lives and our personality and our experience in life that we don't realize that you've probably had low grade I've probably had low grade anxiety for years that I've been able to whack-a-mole. I've been able to defend against. I've been able to suppress through behavior modification and controlling my environment. It's kind of like, I love when people come in my office and say, I don't have any phobias. I'm, I'm not anxious. I don't have any problems. I just don't fly or go on airplane or um um, cars, or I don't travel. I don't go on trains, planes, or automobiles. You know, I just limit my life to what I can control. I don't go to social gatherings. I don't put myself out there. I just live on social media where I can, you know, alter everything and fix it perfectly. In that state, we have convinced ourselves that I'm in control. Thus, I am safe. 
The hard thing is that is reinforcing something that's actually driving your anxiety and depression symptoms. So let me say that again. There is something inside of you being reinforced to stay in an anxiety state because it feels safer to believe that if I'm in control, I ruminate, I think about all the bad scenarios, I catastrophize. If I personalize and figure out why did he or she say that? Was it because of me? Did I do something? Are they trying to get back at me? All of that mental chatter is actually there on purpose and a part of your soul is dedicated to keeping that anxiety there to try to protect you from that root of shame, that belief, oh, dang, I'm not in control. Oh, dang, I really am vulnerable and subject to other people who can influence me. And we live in a broken world where bad things can happen. And so now we have to reconcile when you start getting in a, a plateau with your anxiety or depression symptoms, it's not that you're not working hard enough. It's not that you need more plans and tools and skills. It's that you need to step back and figure out what part of my soul is keeping that symptom in place to protect me from something even more deep, painful, vulnerable inside. And that's where we have to reconcile, I am not in control. I am scared. I am vulnerable. And I'm now requiring somebody who's outside of me, who is bigger than me to take care of me. Now that sounds nice in theory, unless you've had caretakers who, whether real or perceived, didn't meet your emotional needs. You know, there was that big craze in the 80s and 90s to leave infants in their uh, crib and cry it out. And so that was one of the worst things that could have ever happened. I mean, there's probably worse things, but psychology land, that was a terrible, terrible idea to cause an infant to self-soothe when they don't have the capacity to self-soothe because that's a skill that's derived only through relationship and modeling. So they get that from attachment. And then later in toddler and childhood, they can learn to self-soothe because they have a template, they have an experience to draw from. But to do that in infancy is actually one of the worst things you can do to a child because now their soul is anxiously leaning toward relationship through attachment by crying, but the caregiver never comes because they're teaching them to self-soothe. What's actually happening is the child learns to stop crying, which whew, parents go, man, it works. This is fantastic. But the soul of that child, and for many of us, I know my mom did this because, you know, not that was just the trend. That was the pop psychology, which we need discernment of what we're just listening to as pop psychology, especially with social media. Everybody has an idea. Doesn't always mean it's a good idea um, that you would just leave the toddler or the infant crying or the toddler or whatever age. And what that's doing is now the child is taking in a core belief. Others are not going to come. They're not going to meet my needs. I need to be self-dependent, self-sufficient, self-reliant, self. And so if you think about it, as an infant, you're laying in a crib, nobody comes, you don't have to be horribly abused, nothing bad has to happen, nothing dramatic. But if the soul of that child says, I have to rely on myself, and you know that we know at that age, I can't. I'm scared. I'm overwhelmed. I don't even have the capacity to feed myself or change myself or pick myself up or soothe me. And so it creates this unconscious anxiety, this fear, this panic that I am alone, under-equipped, scared, and vulnerable in a big world that I don't know how to navigate. So in a pop psychology world that wants to give you the five steps to not have anxiety, I'm asking you to think deeper. I'm asking you to recognize maybe there are parts of your soul that got stuck doing an old role that's trying to help you and to start honoring and thanking that part of you. That for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that part of you has been allowing anxiety thoughts and feelings to surface so that you can stay in this place, in this illusion of control to try to defend against the shame, the panic, the fear, the dread, the foreboding, 
that if the world really is dependent on me being in charge and in control in order to be safe, that's frightening. And so now we're going to think through all the worst case scenarios. And so instead of fighting against those intrusive thoughts, the panic attacks, the anxiety, the phobia, could we switch it? Could we now reparent even at that really young age that your ego, which is kind of that center part of your personality that modulates everything, if your ego, which is now getting healthier uh, through life experience and healthy relationship, that just like if you were to bend down before a child who is feeling scared, what if when you're anxious, you bend down to that child inside and say, hey, I see your anxiety. I see that you feel scared. I see that you're trying to come up with all the worst case scenarios to try to protect yourself so that you feel like you have control because you're afraid of what it means if you're not in control. And I want to honor pain, scared, disappointment, frustration, hate, anger that you might have felt when you were left in a moment, even though the parents might not have done anything bad but you were left in a panic moment without a prefrontal cortex. You don't understand that they are coming back. But in that moment, it was real to you. And there was an enemy to lie to your little soul. You're on your own. You have to depend on yourself. Nobody's coming. There's something wrong with you. And that's why they're not coming or that's why they're yelling or that's why they're shaking you or their face looks like displeasure. Can you slow down? Can you picture the you that went through whatever you went through? And again, it doesn't have to be big case trauma. It could be anything that to your soul felt like I am a disappointment. I am a displeasure. I am not good enough. I am out of control. So I need to grab control. I'm not good. So I need to become perfect to try to overcompensate for all this latent anxiety, all this fear and insecurity that's never been properly acknowledged, ministered to, or healed. Could we slow down? Instead of just behavior modification, could you pull back and spend time letting your soul be tended to, being truly cared for? Because you're worth that and your soul is worth that. And when you have the intrusive thoughts, which I know are so obnoxious, instead of getting mad, that would be a great time to say, thank you, soul. Thank you, part of me that's the worry wart that's trying to protect me from bad things. I love you. I appreciate you. I honor you. And I bring you into conscious awareness so that you can finally lay down that role that you don't have to be in that posture anymore. You don't have to carry the weight of me defending against my vulnerability. And as we surrender that control, now new opportunities for growth can come. New opportunities for surrender and for relying on others and acknowledging our need and cultivating intimacy and creating opportunity for someone else's strengths to get to minister to us, to tend to our soul. This spectrum of control is such an interesting thing because for many of us, we are trying to manage our environment, control and manipulate our circumstances so that we feel safe. And while that works for us for a while, you're probably just like the rest of us going to hit the end of that. And it's like, oh, dang, I'm not in control, whether it's your kids and they're making bad decisions or it's your college and they've just made a policy change and that's going to affect you or your job. And they're requiring something of you that you don't feel comfortable with or something changes in the economy. And now you don't have that job that you used to or whatever that for you might be many of us have a moment where we realize I am not in control of the world, of others, and my circumstances. You do have the fruit of self-control. And now that's different. That's a stewardship issue where my hands are open. I'm saying, okay, I choose to recognize my role and responsibility in my life. I choose to recognize that what I do matters and we will do a whole episode on learned helplessness and how that's an ingredient in both the anxiety and depression spectrum, because at that unconscious level, we are deciding who is in control 
And many of us are searching for Google and YouTube and psychology to tell us that answer instead of loving on our soul and realizing there is somebody outside of me, human and spirit realm, who loves you more than you can ever fathom. And the issue is if we only bring him into the, the light, into the conscious part, then all this underground where if somebody says to me, I have these thoughts, but I don't know where they're coming from. I have these feelings and impressions, but I don't know where they're coming from. I have these impulses, but I don't know where they're coming from. Usually it's because there's a door open on the inside that some part of the soul is using that symbolically as a way to try to defend and protect against being out of control. And so if you think about anxiety, we'll do another one just on depression, but today we wanted to focus on anxiety. Anxiety is about the illusion of control. And in that state, we burn ourselves out. We're perfectionistic. We're trying to defend against our vulnerability, our flaws and imperfections. And in that place, we are not allowing ourselves to befriend our vulnerability, befriend our own pain and our own story and experience that whether it was macro big events or micro and then chronics just disconnects, just relationships that just kind of were funky and just weren't what you needed. Whatever it might have been, that can leave a infrastructure. And like we'll say many times on this channel, that it's not just the event that causes dysfunction. It's how my internal world structured itself based on that event. That's how I can have somebody, you know, one appointment, the human trafficked client, and the next person is like the mom who has her mom was overly anxious and helicoptery. And yet they have very similar symptoms on the outside because the infrastructure of fear, control, and manipulation became styles to try to protect the soul. Soul. The ego learned to manage the environment in ways that were helpful at the time, but not productive in the long term. And when it solidifies at that unconscious automaticity level, it's still running in the background, even though you're not thinking about it. And I hear that confusion a lot in people where they're like, I don't think about my childhood. I don't think about that. That didn't, I'd never even crossed my mind that that impacted me. That's nice. It didn't cross my mind that my parents were speaking English. It didn't cross my mind that we ate with our right hand and, you know, washed our hands after going to the bathroom. Like that didn't cross my mind. Those are just things I was being imprinted by. I was things I was being impacted by. And for many of us, we have learned to pick things up in this culture to function, to survive, to lower our anxiety, but it's keeping that anxiety in place. So I just want to take a moment to just breathe refreshing over you, that it's not a lack of willpower. If you're having panic attacks and you're struggling to go to work or get out of bed or uh, be in social situations or fly on an airplane or go to the supermarket, whatever your anxiety is starting to kind of shrink your life, you're not bad. You're not weak. It's not a lack of willpower. Actually, many of you have very strong willpowers and I'll always tell my clients, you're one of the strongest people I know. That's crazy. But it's just the opposite. It's actually an issue of surrender. It's actually learning how to lower those defenses, lower the walls, lower the illusion of control and bend down and with humility and curiosity, start to discover from the vantage point of the child that you were when you went through those events, how did that act, impact you? How did that cause your soul to structure itself in core beliefs and responses to try to feel safe in the world? And then you start journaling, you start processing, and you start writing thank you letters to your soul. Write a thank you letter to those that you used to judge. And now as an adult, you can say, oh, they were doing the best that they could based on the circumstances of what they lived for and lived through. Good golly, they did the best that they could, even if it was a little bit jacked up. And so we can start thanking people. We can start stepping outside of time and allowing this infrastructure that got solidified early in life that's just been running on autopilot to now fall away and to be replaced by peace 
to be um, replaced by intimacy and trust and saying, hey, Lord, I want to invite you to be friends with this part of me that's carrying pain, to be friends with this part of me that's carrying anxiety as a protection mechanism against pain. And I want to surrender control and to pick up stewardship, which is very different than the illusion of control. We're going to cover many more of these topics. I think it's going to be like a series uh, is my sense. And so I am grateful to be in this journey with you. I'm grateful to be human. It's not always fun or flattering, um, but I am excited for you to be unlocked. I'm excited for you to be free, for your mind to be at peace, for that mental chatter to no longer be a defense and a coping mechanism that your soul thinks it's helping, but it's not actually helping. And I want you to be free of depression and other relationship dynamics and self-sabotage dynamics. And so we're going to continue to cover a lot of these topics at deeper levels so that you can walk in greater freedom. But obviously my encouragement is that you would reach out if there's a therapist, a pastoral counselor, a life coach, some resource in your life that you are getting that personal ministry. And this is just an adjunct or an adjacent skill that you can kind of glean from this, but it is wise to have somebody walk with you. Even in my own life, I have my own appointments. I am constantly trying to make sure that my soul is being ministered to so that I can walk in greater healing and freedom and anointing so that when I'm ministering to people, they're getting the overflow of good and health versus burnout and tired and showing up and doing it, gutting through it. Life doesn't have to be that hard. I love you guys. Thanks for joining us for this episode. Please share and subscribe and leave comments so we know better how we can serve you. Hey friends, thanks for listening. We would love for you to get plugged in with the Unlock You community. So follow the links below and stay up to date with upcoming content, events, and groups. We are here to invest in you and tailor episodes around your interests. Post comments, and hey, if there are any specific topics you'd like to hear about, let us know so we can strategically build content that is meaningful to you. And will you share this podcast so we can invest into more amazing people? Be sure to hit subscribe so we can see you for the next episode.